In this video, we're going to be talking about engine tuning. Now, every engine that uses a fuel injection system typically has two tables that really drive or create the performance of how that engine runs. And those two tables are your fueling table and then your ignition table. On the fueling side, that is a table that dictates how much fuel the engine needs at a certain RPM and load range to match your target air to fuel ratio. On the ignition side, that is your timing or the advanced timing of the actual spark plug igniting the air fuel mixture in a combustion chamber before top dead center to maximize the mechanical advantage of that piston receiving that pressure wave and sending it back into the engine. To really dial this system in, you need two sets of data. For the fuel table, you need a wideband O2 sensor. And what that O2 sensor does is it reads the air fuel ratio in the exhaust system on the ignition data side, what you really need there is you need to know how much power your engine's creating. In that way, you're able to maximize that mechanical advantage based on that ignition timing that your engine can handle. The O2 sensor is a fairly simple setup. You put it in the car, you turn it on, you start getting readings and you log the data and you adjust your tune. The engine load is a different story. This is why dynos exist, why people take your car to somewhere, put it on a dyno, turn it on and load up the engine. And there's steady state tuning and then transient tuning, which is a power run, which you probably typically see. What I'm trying to do is replicate the exact same information that I'd get from a dyno session on the road. I'm not trying to avoid a dyno by any means, but I do like the idea of being able to replicate the data that a dyno would give me on the road. In a past video, I put a strain gauge on the CRX's uh, front control arm to pick up the load that the engine was creating as I accelerated. And if I can figure out how to post that link, I'll put it either up here somewhere or you can find it in the description below. But the strain gauge data, which these are a bunch of strain gauges, uh, it's been working great. Right now that data is being plotted versus time, but it's not giving me, or it's not replicating the data that a dyno would put out, which is that awesome table of engine RPM versus power. So I can really look at the engine load versus you know, where it's at timing wise to dial in that ignition table. That's where this chip comes in. This is a frequency to voltage converter. It takes a certain range of frequency, converts it to a certain range of voltage, and I'm gonna feed that to my same, same data acquisition unit. What I'll do then is be able to back out some engine RPM, graph that information, really refine that ignition table, and we are ready to party. Let me get into a little bit more about my data acquisition unit because I don't think I've ever gone into detail on that. I'm gonna talk about what this chip does to that system and then uh, we have some setup things that we're gonna have to jump into as well. So let's get that data acquisition unit on the table. This is my data acquisition case. So it is not a traditional mobile or automotive or even motorsport um, data acquisition unit. And I've got some pretty good reasons I'll jump into as far as why, but the case isn't anything special. What's inside of it is. So what I have here is an Instranet i100 uh, data acquisition module. In my non-YouTube life, this device has repeatedly generated really clean data sets that are easy to interpret. It has tools on the back end as far as reading that into other softwares that makes it fantastic and easy to use. And so when it came time to get a mobile data acquisition rig, it wasn't about finding something out there that already existed and then applying that to what I have. It was about making this thing mobile so that I could use it moving forward. So that's what I have here in the case. I basically have a DC to AC inverter to then power the entire system as well as a controller. And then I have all of my sensor hookups. Now I've got these 3D printed little tabs up here. Those hold the laptop in place while I actually do my engine tuning on my data runs. And then over here, I've got several ports for sensor, power, and USB stuff. Now this, this is the actual, well, this one has a different frequency range, but it's similar to the actual frequency to voltage uh, converter that I mentioned. I'll go ahead and post up a image, probably right there, of the actual wiring of this thing. You can see it's really straightforward. You give it power, um, you give it a ground, then you give it your frequency, and then it puts out its own voltage system. Okay, with all that being covered, I'm gonna kick off a little bit of a box modification montage. Uh, these wires I had feeding in here were just for testing purposes, make sure everything worked out like it should. I'm gonna go ahead and add another bulkhead Deutsch connector here. Then we're gonna stick it back in the car, dial in that voltage to RPM relationship, keep things moving.
If you've worked with Open ECU before, you know that you have the ability to log data as you're driving. You can do it during a power run, just cruising around, um, essentially whatever you want to do. So that ECU typically comes with additional inputs and outputs that you can use to attach other sensors to. Now, why haven't I taken my strain gauge and fed it to the ECU instead of taking RPM from the car and feeding it to my data acquisition unit? It has to do with the post-processing or the signal converting and signal interpreting um, that other devices can do as opposed to what this DAC can do. This instrument is really meant to receive that strain gauge data where you're looking for millivolts, individual millivolt changes over the supplied voltage so that you can pick up the strain in that way. I didn't find any equipment out there that made that process really clean to work with. Um, nothing that was cost effective or anything like that. So it's all about that scaling of the signal, cleaning up the data, and then really getting what you need from it, which is why RPM is going into the DAC where I get my cleaner data that I can kind of go through and work with, as opposed to strain gauge data going back into the ECU. Okay, so quick update. I have the fuel injectors installed that happened to go out at the same time I was testing the data acquisition unit. It took a few trial and errors to figure out if I was getting 12 pulses um, from the crank signal or eight pulses per rotation from the crank signal. Uh, it turns out it's 12. So I had to change the sensor one more time to get a little bit more frequency range, but we're good to go. I honestly don't remember the last time I turned on the camera. It has been an incredibly frustrating two to three weeks um, because this thing, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't say or doesn't do what it says it's supposed to do. I have bought so many of these thinking maybe I got a faulty one. I've adjusted this little potentiometer on here that, that doesn't do anything. I have tested different voltage ranges, different frequency input ranges. This one's uh, zero to 1000 Hertz and it scales a zero to five volt output signal, kind of like I mentioned earlier, but it doesn't do that. Um, it kind of wakes up around 2000 RPM and you can work the map backwards if you want to know what Hertz that is before 2000 RPM doesn't do anything. And then if you are following along, you can do the math. It tops out at 5000 RPM. Really, I need one that doesn't go to zero to 1000 Hertz. I need 1600 Hertz. Something in between the next step up is 3000 Hertz. But guess what? The 3000 Hertz one doesn't start seeing any actual RPM uh, ever. Not within the range of, from zero all the way to 65, 7000 RPM. So I basically hit a wall and I had no idea what to do. I tried to take these and I tried to take a zero to 1000 Hertz one and then also pair in a zero to 3000 Hertz one. I tried to get a zero to 10, 000, or zero to 10 volt one that was zero to 3000 Hertz and then hope with the idea that the zero to five volt part of the signal would be zero to 1500 Hertz. Um, but none of that worked. Not a single bit of that worked. I had reached the end of what I could do, unfortunately, and I called up my brother and I'm gonna put up his face somewhere here on the camera. So if you see him, you give him a big old high five or a low five because thanks to him, and approximately an hour and a half of figuring it out, he put his electrical engineering skills to work. He called me back and he said, hey, go get an LM2907 in dash eight slash NOPB, okay? And that is a Texas Instruments uh, frequency to voltage converter. It's actually the component that's used in a lot of production vehicles to take pulse based signal and convert it to voltage so that your car can read it. This little thing, there's the beauty product, uh, has an example on the tech sheet page, which I'll put up here as well. And the example basically says with these couple of resistors and capacitors, uh, it should work. And so their example had different input voltage, had different output voltage. So what I did is I worked the math backwards and I scaled their setup to my setup using a roughly 12 to 14 volts input, knowing that I wanted zero to five volts and my frequency range was zero to 1600 Hertz, which would be like ultimately 8,000 RPM. And it works, it works way better than this one. And I just had to make the circuit myself. So 
I'm probably gonna put a picture of that up right here. I didn't show that process because it was incredibly frustrating to figure that out. The car actually works now. I'm able to get my uh, RPM Hertz signal converted to voltage that my DAC can read. It's doing a fantastic job at cleaning up all the strain gauge data, amplifying it without creating a whole bunch of noise and distortion. And so now I need to scale my RPM range to uh, my voltage output that I'm seeing from the chip. I'm gonna go do that right now. I'm gonna turn on the camera, jump in the car, get my plateau's voltage. I'm gonna try and hold the pedal just right so I can kind of line up 2000 RPM, 3000 RPM, 4000 and so on for three or four seconds, graph that data, and then I'll be able to draw an equation that scales voltage to RPM and then hit the dang road. At least that's the idea. Let's see how it goes. 2250. Stay there for a minute. 2,000 is just tricky. All right, let's go to 3,000. There's 3,000. There's 4,000. 5,000. 6,000. And 6,500. It's officially the next day, and I was able to review all of the data, comb over it, clean it up a little bit, and I have compiled it all to this graph that I'm gonna put on the screen now. Now, what you're seeing here is the tune three versus tune four, which just so you know, tunes one and two leading up to three, we're all getting the air to fuel mixtures just right across the RPM uh, spectrum. So in this graph, what you're seeing is tune three compared to tune four, where fuel is all held exactly the same. What we're looking at is ignition timing or differences in ignition timing. I was able to pull out about 50% more power just out of an NA engine. So the tune that I downloaded through uh, the Han data servers, it was extremely conservative. You kind of expect it to be, but, um, but yeah, just a simple upgrade in a lot of the timing and you saw, I saw 50% more power that the car was able to generate. Now again, that's not horsepower on the Y-axis, that's actually the micro strain that that control arm is seeing as I accelerate the vehicle. But in a run to run basis, I can compare one run to the next run to the next run and I can actually gauge what the vehicle is doing differently. Now I can go back to my ignition tuning table. I can see that up higher in the RPM range, I can probably give it a little bit more timing or advance the timing a little bit more. And then down low, I can kind of clean it up per RPM bandwidth, according to the ignition table that I mentioned earlier on. So what's next with all of this? I'm gonna spend a little bit more time cleaning up the tune. Really, it's an NA engine, nothing special except um, intake and exhaust. So I'm not expecting huge power gains out of it or anything like that. The idea here was to get a process for tuning the engine with reliable, good data, other than just doing it off of fuel. So that when the turbo engine goes in the car, which it's gonna go in the car pretty soon, I'll be able to employ this same exact technique and same exact data acquisition tools, tune it on the road, really refine it, and then uh, keep an eye on things as the car progresses in life. With all that being said, that's gonna wrap up this video. If you liked what you saw, feel free to like, subscribe, all that YouTube stuff. And like always, thank you for watching.